In a previous video, I demonstrated the destructive capabilities of a gumball as a projectile. In this video, I'm going to explore the trade-off between mass and velocity, and perhaps even add some meaningful considerations to the age-old debate. Stay tuned. It's worth noting that in this video I'm talking about bullets, not cartridges. Pictured here are cartridges, 22 long rifle, 5.56 NATO, and 30 6 In the case of these three, the larger cartridge is more powerful, and that's generally the case as well. The larger the brass casing, the more powder is fit inside, and hence a higher power. In the case of the 22 long rifle, the bullet weighs about 40 grains and is traveling at around 1200 feet per second. The 5.56 green tip weighs about 62 grains, and the bullet of the 30 6 weighs about 150 grains. The latter two cartridges both send their bullets at 2,920 feet per second. That means that the 22 long rifle has about 128 foot-pounds of energy, the 5.56 carries around 1,175, and the 30-06, 2,840. So you can see that as a cartridge gets a little bit bigger, it gets a lot more powerful. But the focus of this video is different. I'm going to be testing a bunch of different projectiles with vastly differing weights from the same apparatus used in this video. If you haven't seen it, check it out here. What's important to note about this is that it's a pneumatic system, and the same amount of work is exerted each time to pressurize the chamber. But though the same amount of work is used to pressurize the system, that does not mean that the gun exerts the same amount of work on each projectile in the same way. It seems like the pressures being used here have an upper limit of exerting 100 foot-pounds of energy on a projectile, but we have projectiles that will only receive 40 foot-pounds of energy. Let's take a closer look. Reading from left to right, we have a gumball, which I featured in that prior video, a glass marble, pulled from a paint can, a steel ball bearing, a blend of 60% tin and 40% lead, a heavier lead tin blend, a full lead round ball, and a full lead maxi ball. And I neglected to include it here, but also a lighter maxi ball made from that 60% tin and 40% lead alloy. In order of appearance and measured in grains, the projectiles weigh 27, 55, 131, 137, 152, 185, and 365. And the 60-40 tin to lead maxi ball weighs 272 grains. And you can see that it's much harder than the lead one, as you can see that there's almost no deformation compared to the lead. Here are some unique features of each projectile. The gumballs like to shatter when they hit anything, including snow and water, and only require one patch to fit in the 55 caliber barrel. These glass marbles are just small enough to fit inside the 55 caliber barrel with one patch. It's a really tight fit. They're pulled from a paint can and are honestly really hard to come by. The steel ball bearings were purchased as slingshot ammo, and they're supposed to be stainless steel, but they do rust. Their most valuable trait to me is that they're incredibly hard, which makes them really great for punching through hard targets. And they're magnetic, but I'm not sure what utility that is. All of the cast round balls are made in the same 495 round ball mold. Up first is a 60% tin and 40% lead blend, made from these big bars of lead solder. Next I have that heavier tin and lead blend. I added some more semi-pure lead to this solder to get a projectile that splits the difference in weight. These were a little bit easier to cast, but honestly casting in lead is just so much easier across the board. Next is the almost pure lead round balls. I'm sure these have some antimony in them, and they're black because they're covered in graphite. I tumbled these in a rock tumbler for several hours to knock down the sprues and any imperfections. And with the case of the two heaviest projectiles, they are meant to be shot from a rifled barrel. I believe a 1 in 48 twist is what is recommended for these. My homemade air gun is a smooth bore, and they happened to fly straight in my tests this time, but I've had tests in the past where this was certainly not the case. These projectiles have a conical tip to them, and they might have a different ballistic coefficient, which might matter in the terminal ballistics, which I'll discuss later. And as I mentioned before, the tin to lead was much harder than the pure lead ones. Pictured here are some of the projectiles being used. The full lead on the left, the steel balls, the marbles, the maxi balls, and one of the tin lead blends. It's clear to see that the marbles are the largest projectiles. The tumbled pure lead balls seem to be a little bit smaller than the non-tumbled ones all the way on the right, but if there is a difference it's probably very insignificant. I believe that the steel balls and the maxi balls are almost exactly 50 caliber. 
I did my best to make up these differences in diameter with different thicknesses of patching. Let's start the show with the heaviest, 365 grain lead maxi balls. Weighing 365 grains and traveling at 351 feet per second, that maxi ball is carrying 99.88 foot-pounds of energy. And you can see that it lodged itself in the wood fairly deeply. The terminal ballistics test on the water jug resulted in underwhelming results. You can see that there is no tearing of the water jug and simply a hole punched in the front and back of it. Next up is the maxi ball made from 60% tin and 40% lead. All right, well, simple as it is, I didn't think of this earlier. So the conditions aren't perfect. So the data might not be as accurate as it could be, but at least we're getting a data point. Seems like two patches on the maxi ball was too tight a fit. And that was a mistake that I made in not remembering how many patches I used. It still lodged itself pretty deeply in the wood, about the same as the lead one. So I ran a second test with just a single patch and picked up 10 feet per second, weighing 272 grains, and traveling at 390 feet per second, it's carrying 91.89 foot-pounds of energy. Considering just how similar a projectile it is to the full lead blend, I don't think we should have seen that much of a difference. So I think that these milk jugs are not consistent. I will take what I consider to be the three most noteworthy projectiles and give them a second test on identical jugs. Next up is the projectile I was hoping would win, the full lead round ball. Weighing 185 grains and traveling at 459 feet per second, the lead round ball is carrying 86.57 foot-pounds of energy and lodged itself in the wood fairly deep. That didn't look a whole lot different than the tin to lead maxi ball to me. You can see it punched out a pretty neat piece of plastic. You can see it punched a neat hole in the front and tore through the back. This is that heavier tin to lead blend. Weighing 152 grains and traveling at 490 feet per second, this ball is carrying 81.06 foot-pounds of energy. You can see that it did not bury itself as deeply as the pure lead ball did, but this could be due to inconsistencies in wood grain. The way I saw it, that looked to be more effective than the maxi ball. And I'm interested to hear your thoughts in the comments on if the jug falling off the stand is an indication of high or low energy transfer. I happen to think it's on the higher side, but please put any dissent in the comments below, I'd love to hear it. Up next is the 60% tin and 40% lead blend. Weighing 137 grains and traveling at 508 feet per second, that ball is carrying 78.52 foot-pounds of energy. And as you can see, that lighter tin to lead blend buried itself deeper in the wood than the heavier one, which is carrying more energy. This seems counterintuitive, and I believe it's due to the inconsistencies in wood grain mentioned earlier. I should have shot phone books, but they're hard to come by. I believe these jugs with the white caps, which originally came with water in them, are not as strong as the milk jugs with the red caps. It does make for an impressive display though, and keep in mind I will be repeating this test later in the video. Next up is the steel ball bearings. Steel ball. Weighing 131 grains and traveling at 518 feet per second, the steel balls are carrying 78.07 foot-pounds of energy. That's less than half a foot-pound different than the 60-40 blend.
Weighing only 6 grains less than the 60-40-10 to lead blend and traveling only 10 feet per second faster, it's no surprise that the ballistics test did not show much difference. Next up we have the glass marbles. Alright, here goes the glass marble. This one was honestly super duper tight with a single patch. That came back and hit me right here. And there's the marble. I know, my shoelaces are untied. I was in and out of the door a lot. All in one piece, that's kind of good news. We can shoot it again. It might be compromised though. We'll see. Weighing 55 grains and traveling at 608 feet per second, that marble was carrying 45.16 foot-pounds of energy, and it only left a small divot in the wood. But keep in mind, this is two-inch pressure-treated lumber. I know that was one of the weaker plastic jugs, but for only 45 foot-pounds, that was honestly pretty impressive. And then finally, we have those ultra-light gumballs. Weighing 27 grains and traveling at 839 feet per second, that gumball is carrying 42.21 foot-pounds of energy. That's the gumball, and that's the glass marble. It's about 55 grains, I believe, and about 26, 27. And here we see the first projectile that failed to exit the jug. Upon impact, the gumball shattered, which means that it dumped all 42 foot-pounds of energy into the target. Even though the gumballs shatter on impact, they're still pretty deadly projectiles. Just check out that video I mentioned earlier. And it would honestly create a medical nightmare to pull out all those fragments. However, it's possible that the human body could just absorb them. I made air bolts for this air gun, and they weigh about 547 grains. Ooh, only 223. 223 feet per second means 60.42 foot-pounds of energy. And finally, we see the results of this test on a graph in which we can do some, at least rough, interpolation. The results of the test could be highly skewed because that arrow is a very different type of projectile, and it has a lot more friction in the barrel. But, for the sake of it, let's just pretend it's okay. According to this crude graph, it seems that we have an optimal bullet weight of about 300 grains, which is a lot more than my hoped-for 185. I think the reason why a heavier bullet is best in this case is because it spends the most time in the barrel. Obviously there is a point of diminishing return where the bullet does just get too heavy, which is why 300 is the best. But in any case, from around 290 grains to, say, 350, the bullet is carrying around 100 foot-pounds of energy, which, as I said, was the point of diminishing return. It seems like we may have a lower bound on 40 foot-pounds of energy as well. Keep in mind, this is at a given chamber pressure. I'm going to discuss changes in pressure a little bit later. And please feel free to put your own interpretation of any and all data in the comments. I'd love to read it. Now, just because a given projectile had the most energy transferred into it, doesn't mean that that same projectile will most effectively transfer its energy into the target. I think this is what we're seeing with the maxi balls, and that they carry a lot more of their energy beyond the target. Let's take a closer look with my three projectiles of choice, the maxi ball, the lead ball, and the steel ball. That was the maxi ball, and recall that it weighs 365 grains. And as I had suspected earlier, it does appear that that first jug was stronger than the others. There you can see the crater left by the projectile after it had gone through the jug. That was the pure lead ball, and it seems that it did more tearing. Note the tearing behind the handle. And after going through the jug, it left a slightly smaller crater than the maxi ball. And that was the steel ball. Recall that that one had the least energy of the three, but it appeared to do the most tearing. 
It's very similar to the lead ball, but it is slightly more. And you can see that it also left a small crater where it impacted the ground, but smaller than the other two. I think that we're seeing different energy transfers because of drag. Here's the equation courtesy of NASA, where the coefficient is going to be a function of the projectile's shape. The density is that of the fluid. In most cases it's going to be air, but in this case it's water. The reference area is going to be constant, but the velocity squared over 2 is different. Now it being squared is important because an increase in velocity means an exponential increase in drag. And I think that's where we're seeing that the faster projectiles are transferring more energy in a shorter amount of time. Hence that the steel ball that had less overall energy is able to impart more of that energy on the target. Now I might have just brought up the controversial issue of hydrostatic shock, so feel free to hash it out in the comments. But I think even in this case, we're not seeing supersonic shock waves, but we're seeing an increased energy transfer with higher velocity. I think part of the reason we're able to see this difference so well is because we're looking at 78 foot-pounds of energy compared to 100 foot-pounds of energy in a relatively large diameter projectile, 50 caliber. And in said projectiles, a difference of about 170 feet per second translates to a large difference in drag. Feel free to let me know if I'm way off base here, but I think I might be onto something. And if you're watching this raise the roof physics, let's hash out these numbers. I'll put links to two sources I found interesting and relevant to the topic in the description of this video. This graph looks at pumps of the external bicycle pump to pressurize the chamber as they relate to the velocity of the projectile. In this case, the test projectile was the 185 grain lead round ball. And even just visually, I think this trend line is way off base, but I wasn't able to effectively manipulate Excel. If there are any math or Excel junkies out there, by all means, please point out my mistakes. This next graph, I believe, is much more accurate. Looks like we have a linear relationship, and the extrapolation honestly looks like it could be pretty accurate. And it looks like that at about 90 pumps, we would reach 200 foot-pounds of energy, or double what we've seen here. And pumps to chamber pressure shows that about 90 pumps would be around 500 psi. The working limit of the gun is 550 psi, but running it at 500 psi sounds more prudent. Again, I don't have a compressor to do this, which I mentioned in a previous video. One thing I found incredibly fascinating about this graph is the 14.5 as the y-intercept, which just so happens to be one atmosphere. It's really amazing when math in the real world overlap so vividly. So just going back to that other graph, 90 pumps or 500 psi translates to 200 foot-pounds of energy, which I believe to be the limit of the power of this apparatus, and I really look forward to testing this someday. Anyway, that's all I have for you today. It's a rather long video, but I hope you found it interesting and entertaining. I appreciate you sticking around till the end, and I hope to see you next time. Thanks.